Okay, we're to our 2021 legislative session preparation. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. Um, and board members, if I think we can endure the next couple items, and then I think as we go into executive session, we'll try to have a break if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> um, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, so the first item is an information item. We're you know wanting to make sure that the board is uh, fully informed about the you know recently committed com completed common data committee process, the CDC process that we've talked about in prior meetings. Um, what you're about to get is informational only, but it's very relevant to um, what will likely occur um, starting with EAC with the Executive Appropriations Committee later this month. And then obviously, and of course, into the legislative session uh, based on you know the impacts of COVID to our enrollment counts. Uh, so with that, Further ado, uh, Chair, if I could turn it over to School Finance Director Patrick Lee. Uh, we'll run through these as quickly as possible. We'll come back with even more information and you know, we just wanna start putting this in front of board members so you start um, becoming familiar with a lot of the terminology and the processes and systems that are gonna you know, be obviously talked about in depth as we get into the session together. So uh, can I turn it over to him through you, Chair? Patrick. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, Deputy Superintendent Jones and Chair Huntsman and board. Um, some of the, the information that we have here, we did review with the board at the meeting on November 5th, but we weren't quite finished with the, the common data committee process yet. So there is the, the final and uh, most important piece, which uh, is related to the weighted pupil units and the amount of uh, WPU amounts that will will go into uh, fiscal year 22. Um, so starting out, um, I'll, I'll just quickly review the process which we had gone over with uh, with the board at the November 5th meeting. Uh, so if we can go to the, the first slide on that, um, the process is, is made up of uh, USBE, the LFA, Fiscal Analyst Office, uh, Governor's Office of Management and Budget. And there is a portion where the state tax commission, particularly on the revenue portion, where they contribute. Um, there are three meetings, as most of you are probably aware of, the property valuations meeting, which is the revenue, the student enrollment projections meeting, which is related to the consensus enrollment numbers. And then the final meeting, which we did not have yet the last time that we presented some of this to the board, is the weighted pupil unit estimates meeting. And that was held on November 9th with some follow-up discussions from there. Um, so in the next slide, uh, this the, in this slide, we had reviewed this portion of things with the board related to the, the revenue piece, which is the basic levy. And the basic levy is the tax rate set in order to raise the majority of the local revenue that supports the minimum school program in each district. So this outlines what that revenue is for the coming fiscal year, fiscal year 22, um, in particular tax year 2021, what those projections are. So we start with the revenue in that first meeting and then moving from there to the, to the next slide, the, after the revenue meeting is the enrollment projections. So if we can scroll down just a little bit, we did review some of this related to the projections and you, and you can see here with each of the uh, points related to the districts and the charters, there's some variations. The bottom line is that the total projected enrollment for 2021-2022 school year is estimated or projected to be 673,854. Um, the total actual enrollment for this year is at the 666,000 which is the enrollment from October 1 counts. So you can see some of the differences there and that obviously factors into what the final piece is in the uh, CDC process is the WPU estimates, which is on the next slide. Okay, so the, the initial CDC consensus for the basic school program, there were 891,150 total WPUs including the enrollment growth. However, the final CDC consensus, that's where we started, excuse me, 
was the 891,000. The final consensus for the CDC WPU amounts was that it is at 885,540. So some of the discussion this year with the LFA and GOMB revolved around how do we handle not being sure about what things will look like next year. And so with the enrollment projections being down as well as the enrollment counts being down, um, the question came up, how do we handle that in relation to the WPUs, which is affected by that? So the, the consensus for now is that there will be an enrollment growth contingency of WPUs, which shows here the estimate is at 7,727. So the, the idea is that as uh, we move into the session, there will be this base amount of the WPUs and then a set aside amount of WPUs, which is the 7,727. Uh, the total for that, as you can see there, is 886,364 WPUs that are projected or estimated for fiscal year 22. The total growth cost estimate that we've arrived at is 27.8 million ongoing and 5.3 million one time. Now that includes in, uh, 11.9 million in voted in board, uh, which this, this was voted upon in August by the EAC that this would not, um, this would not feed into the enrollment growth cost. Um, this, this is the final portion of the WPU. And of course, as Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones mentioned, as the legislature go into the EAC this month, this will be part of the discussion. And then of course, as we move into the session next year, this will be a big piece of what will happen in the committee and, and some of the discussion that will need to be finalized. One, one last part that I would like to mention to the board is related to the CDC process itself. On the last slide, just is noting that we will hold a meeting, I believe on uh, December 11th. So all of the, the members of the CDC uh, process uh, will come together and we'll, we'll basically review the process that's occurred and look at any changes that might need to happen for the process in the future, um, starting next year, and perhaps what we need to do along the way to prepare for that. So some of the, the things that will be discussed will include the assumptions that affect the revenues, the enrollment and the funding projections, and committee members will also determine any adjustments or, or changes that might need to be made to some of the projection models uh, if that needs to happen. This was a really challenging year to be able to, to create these projections. And part of that was actually holding a pre-meeting to each of the consensus meetings that are normally held. So in total, there are six meetings altogether for the CDC process this year, which is actually a bit unusual because it's normally just three different meetings. Um, but Patrick, we've got a couple of hands. Oh, sure, yeah. That's all I have for the presentation. So if there's any questions. Okay. I didn't know if you were going to go on. No, I, sir. Okay. A um, couple questions or comments. Board Member Cannon. Yes. Uh, as I look at your 885,540 total WPUs, I'm wondering if uh, you include in those special education students who sometimes are funded with multiple WPUs. And we've just heard about from WestEd, you know, their idea of having add-on WPUs. Uh, how do you deal with add-on WPUs when you're looking at this uh, total? Do you not consider them? Uh, it, it, would it, WPUs be equal to ones per student on this or are they somehow uh, worked into the number you've given us here? That's, that's a great question. If I, if I can respond to that, Chair yeah, Huntsman. Please. So uh, the, the 885,000 total represents all programs uh, added up within the basic school program, Board Member Cannon. So that would include the special ed add-on as part of that. that. That is a piece that's broken out, of course, and the WPU amounts are estimated individually for that program. Um, partially in relation to prior years, but there that is part of the formula for that estimate. So it rolls up into that total number of WPU amounts of the 885,540. Chair, if I may, this is Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah Scott. 
I appreciate board member Cannon's question because the next step in this process with the board is to take this briefing and those numbers that we gave to you today and break those down in more detail in your January meeting. So there's this one more meeting that you have before the legislative session starts. So we'll be providing all the details, you know, subject to this other meeting that's taking place on December 11th. You know, we'll have a lot more information or more information on revenue estimates and things like that for your January meeting. And we'll, we'll provide more granular level detail behind these WPU numbers and what programs and categoricals, um, you know, how it's arrayed. So we appreciate that question. If, that, if that's helpful to board member Cannon and the board, sir. You have a follow up, um, board, mem board member Cannon? No, I appreciate knowing the answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. Board member Lear? Um, yes. Patrick, and this is kind of a subjective question for a numbers guy, but I'm looking at this bullet that says enrollment growth contingency and then total growth cost estimate. I remember one of the provisions of Amendment G was that the, the growth we would be given, um, the board would be given the, how do I say this? Growth won't be broken out. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, you can just say, nope, that wasn't there or didn't make it to the final three or whatever. But uh, I recall, and so I'm I'm sort of troubled. I, I'm wondering if you feel okay about, they're not gonna break it out, but oh, we're gonna break it out anyway. Um, I feel like it's maybe uh, sort of a violation of the spirit of Amendment G. Do you, what do you think about that? Um. Scott, Deputy Superintendent Jones. <laughs> Is that too uncomfortable? No. Scott? Well, so, you know, I think maybe we can answer that. It's not uncomfortable. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand your question, though. You're, you're asking if, because, you know, with HB 357 and, you know, Angie can give the policies pr perspective on here, growth is an integral part of that. It's, it's almost a requirement now. So, well, I'm not sure I understand. Are you, you know? I, if, oh, here, let me try one more time and I won't belabor this because it's a philosophical question, but I, I understood that Amendment G would promise the board um, not to break out growth. They just fund all students not and not treat it like we gave you something special because we are now funding all students. And so I feel like in continuing to break out growth, instead of just saying, we're giving you um, whatever 885, 540 plus 7727 is, we're giving you that many WPUs and we might have to adjust that based on changes in enrollment. I feel like they're still breaking it out and pretending like they're giving us some special gift. Um, do you feel like the committee felt that way or do you felt, feel like it was a fair um, discussion? Yeah. Though I thought that was, we wouldn't yeah. have to beg for growth, which is just funding all the students that are there. Right, yeah, you know, okay, so I, that helps a lot. I think um, we'll be able to drill down further next month on this, but no, basic, basically though, you know, the formulas still require us to be able to differentiate you know, with the counts and come to come to terms with the WPU distribution, right? And and how much we project for growth in order to formulate just how much funding is going to be necessary to provide across the whole uh, the whole MSP, the minimum school program. So no, I, I don't, you know, I, I see I, I really believe I see your point in the sense that, you know, we're breaking it out like this, but then you know what the intent of 357 was. So you know, when we get final, final, when we follow the process of Amendment G and 357, you know, I don't think you'll see the breaking out of it like we're doing here, but it, since it's a new year and a new concept, I guess, for Amendment G, we, we felt like we had to do that. I hope I hope that makes sense. There wasn't anything, the committee didn't do anything nefarious or, you know, in order to do that. We just simply had to come up with the calculations um, okay. You know, in order to ensure that there was that distinguished, you know, uh, uh, those distinguished amounts between the, you know, with, with based on the enrollment counts we got. And one thing okay. that's really important. So, yeah. 
board member Lear, is so that in the name of transparency and through the CDC process, um, it's important for us to know what that growth is. We're just not asking for growth. They right. need to know what the growth thing is too. So we get to know in advance because of this process of what, how much of the pie is going toward the, the growth piece. And then, then of course we, we talk about the WPU. So the, the benefit of Amendment G and House Bill 357 isn't ready to come into effect quite yet the way that I'm seeing the process, but, but we want to see the process to have those assurances in place that growth is covered. And then, then we can say, yeah, Amendment G and House Bill 357 says X. And so that's where X is. So I, I but I appreciate your comment too on, yeah. on my, on, on and my- a, a brief follow-up follow chair. And, yeah, and I'll so, just say, I've made it really clear that I loathe Amendment G, but uh, given the unusual nature of this year, I'm at least willing before I'm completely um, cynical that I'll, I'll at least see how this develops and, and goes forward and, and hope that those promises come to fruition, which I would think eventually there is no need to break out growth, perhaps in a planning way, but not in terms of a differentiating the funds. So I just appreciate Scott's candor and I, I appreciate that you felt um, good about discussing it and, and you yeah. felt good about their intentions. We, we, if I may, Chair, just real quick, we, I mean, ultimately we have to fund growth and we need to have an amount to put into the base budget bill. So, you know, there is this calculation aspect to it as well, but, you know, I, I, I think I understand your question, but there was nothing, you know, done, you know, behind the scenes or anything. I mean, we'll, we'll, it, we'll hit the intent of 357 and growth will be funded, so. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, not sir, not sir, that, their hands up. Okay, that concludes the information part. May we segue into the action part and turn it over to um, uh, Del Frost, sir, real quick. Is, is for Del the, Frost ready to yeah. hit I think, the action piece? Yeah, Del, are you on? I, I'm here. I okay. finally made it in. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Chair, if I may, uh, and Angie, can I share my screen? Am I able to do that now? Yes, you can. I, I stopped sharing. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm bringing up, so in your board backups, the main document uh, I, I want us to look at is this Excel file called the 2021 General Legislative Session Budget Tracker. Can you see that document now on your screens? Yep, yep. yes. Okay, great. So if you rem recall from last month, and um, the board prioritized two critical budget items, and that's a 4% increase in the WPU and enrollment growth. And segueing or piggybacking on, on the discussion we just had, you know, a good portion of those should be covered by House Bill 357, and we're watching that closely, and, and, and they are still placeholder amounts on what we think those will cost. And that should be finalized for the executive um, uh, the EAC uh, this month. So uh, I wanted to quickly go over revenues and kind of where we see revenues right now. And it, um, I brought up the, the monthly snapshot and looked at that. So for uh, individual income tax revenues that make up the lion's share of the education fund, the projection was between 2 billion flat and 2.27 billion and, and uh, collections thus far are at 2 billion 53 million. So we're on target, we're within projections, but we're not on the high end of that projection. And uh, what uh, the joint publication between GOMB and LFA said was overall as with sales tax, there's considerable uncertainty about how income taxes will, will perform in the coming months, although current indications are positive. So I, I think we continue on this trend. It's a very uncertain year. We really don't know um, how much revenue we'll have uh, to allocate towards public education. 
and that's you know the uncertainty we have to work with. Um, I think it would be wise to um, you know uh, assume that it's going to be more limited than in prior years, but luckily um, the economy is still relatively strong con considering everything we've gone through during the pandemic and we'll remain hopeful, but I just wanted to kind of give you a revenue picture to the extent that we can. Um, by next board meeting, we will have had the EAC meeting where they will adopt the December revenues. And as you remember, um, those revenues will be revised again in um, February. So the main part of this discussion I wanted to bring up, I've already talked about the 167 million. In this budget tracker, we've uh, presented to you, tried to organize all the many budget requests uh, in different areas, in different ways. So the we are recommending five as staff for your consideration, um, five top priority budget items to which you can um, accept those, amend those, however the board wants, but we wanted to bring those up to really address specific needs that have come up in this COVID era. And then the other recommendations are, are organized as pass-through budget items, or in other words, what goes to LEAs, USBE internal budget items, and then USDB budget items. So um, I'm going to spend most of my time on the top priority budget items and then see where you want to take things as a board. So it, is that an okay direction, Chair? Can we move forward with that? Um, yes. Um, okay. Real quick, before we get into this, board member Davis, are you? Do you have a question? I have a motion when we're ready. Okay. So, did you want to get to your rec? What you're having in your, your recommendations, or? So, what if? if that. Yeah, if if I can go over those five that are recommended by staff for your consideration. And then I can answer any specific questions about the other business cases. And um, I do want to reiterate again, this is an iterative process and we'll have um, other chances to look at this, but wanted to go through those very, um, very briefly. So um, the first one here, and let me see if I can, I don't want to make it too small um, so that you guys can see that. This, this first recommended, so we have this category that we're calling other top priority budget items. Uh, and, and so these are our top priorities other than the two clear critical budget items that we've already discussed. So the early grades professional learning is re requesting that House Bill 114 from last year be funded with some streamlining um, and, and really providing professional learning strategies in those early grades uh, to improve instruction and meet the needs, especially due to learning gaps um, due to COVID. The second here is, is to continue the request for OEK. Last year, we, we received 10 million that went into the base. So to get to that 40% of all uh, students more or less needing um, interventions according to the KEEP assessments, our estimate is 8.692 million. And those are the the two principal ongoing requests that are, are recommended for your consideration into this category. The other three are, are primarily one-time items. The clear message we've gotten from both the legislature and the governor is that if there's going to be um, revenues available to allocate above you know, these basic needs, they're likely going to be one-time items. And so we really, uh, discussed how what are the top needs that can be addressed with one-time funds. And the first has to do with um, broadband access. So there, there's a program that, are, that we've rolled out um, with partners using coronavirus relief funds. It's a competitive grant program for LEAs to help students address the digital divide and broadband access. But that is only for this year. And so the third request would be a one-time request of $5 million to USBE to continue that program and 350,000 of staffing that actually would be through the state library because they have the staffing um, 
and the program already installed over there, um, and as well as some uh, seed money for, for libraries to continue to provide access to students to broadband. We can go into any more, we can go into more details if you need, but the, the, the business cases for all of these are in the backups. And the final two are really about targeted populations of students that need our help due to COVID. As, as we know, uh, students who are at risk um, of academic failure, students in poverty, high mobility students, ELL, uh, limited English proficiency students, homeless and chronic, chronically absent, absent students, excuse me, those are the students that have really been impacted by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And this request here would be for an infusion of funds one time targeted towards those students to be addressed at the local level uh, and, and for local priorities, but to really address the needs of those at students who are at risk. And the, the final one would be a reimbursement program um, to pay for paraprofessionals, tutors, and other things to really engage those, uh, those students who have gone dark, who have not in this COVID era need additional help need people to reach out to them, provide them technical support, whatever is needed. And this would be a one-time funding source to, to, to fund LEA efforts to really get to those students and, and get them progressing academically. I can answer more questions. I know we have a lot of staff on the phone who could answer those types of questions, but wanted to kind of give you an overview of those, those top five that we wanted to recommend uh, that you consider and then um, move forward in, in whichever way you as a board see fit. So I'll, I'll pass thank, it back to you. Thank you, Dell. But <clears throat> once, once we get into motion, um, not sure what order anything will go. Um, so we'll do our best to navig navigate this and be able to track uh, motions from board members. Um, board member Davis. Is this, are you wanting to speak to this particular item or do you have something else yeah. regarding this or? I have a priority motion. Are you ready for that at this point or do you I want think to? Any, well, I, I, I don't know how to sort, I don't know what everyone else is wanting to do through here, but we are in the business of making motions under this actionable item. And so let's, I guess we need to get started. So yes, do you have a, do you have a written motion or one that's, You've already submitted, or is this? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I move that we add the following on the list of funding priorities $12 million for a three year intensive services pilot program as funding priority number three and $6 million ongoing for the most program as funding priority five and moving early grades professional learning to priority eight. It, does staff have this motion or is this one that you have? They should have it. I sent it to, to I think Dale has it. But I sure. asked yes. the move from, for number eight. Chair, I do. Uh, am I? Yeah, uh, I do have that. So let me share the screen with with the, um, the uh, member Davis's motion. Um, let me see. I have to stop sharing. We have, a, we have that motion. Well, that's coming up. Do we have a second? I'll second that, Ms. Board Member Marsh. Okay, we have a motion and a, a second. You want to speak to that motion while this is coming up? Um, sure. Yeah, I'm having a <laughs> an issue. Are, are you able to see the the screen with the motions? Yeah, I am. Okay, great. So I I will have to follow along. Uh, so it was a twelve million for. Uh, and that would be priority three, correct, Member Davis? Correct. Okay. 
Sorry, Dale, I'm going off of the one that Angie wrote and sent to you. Oh, you're right. I'm trying to follow Sorry. these. I apologize. You're right. Let That's me okay. let me copy and paste. And Dale, can I just remind you that I sent you a um, link to a shared doc that has the language there, although I didn't have the third part of that motion, but I can add it there. If you want to go into the shared doc, I can help you draft these motions. Oh, that would be great and because could, this is yeah. Your, then you could your expertise the tracker. Okay, that that would be great. So maybe if you want to share that and I can follow along with the tracker and would that work, Angie? Yes, do you want to dis disengage then for a moment and have me share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. And board member Davis, could you just repeat the last one, um, how you stated it? it was, I believe it was moving what is currently in number one to number eight. Moving number one to number eight, and I can give you the names of those. That would be early grades professional learning. And there's the motion. And I can speak to those. Okay, please, please do while these are being put together. Okay, sure. Um, I feel like especially with the amendment of passing uh, amendment G, um, if we're going to use funds that were traditionally earmarked for um, education for people with disabilities, it should start with students with disabilities. And our um, special education programs are typically underfunded. Every single GASB meeting that I go to with NASB, when they ask, what are your needs? Every single time, the board members from other states are saying, we need additional special education funding because it's just not there. Uh, we have requirements, but we don't have resources to meet the requirements and the needs of the students. So I feel like it's timely and um, we should really act um, following Amendment G. And we've also, no, I studied intensive services ad nauseum this last year. Last year, we had $39 million worth of reimbursement requests for students with intens intensive service needs. After fine tooth combing those for compliance issues, um, our wonderful staff cut that down to $12 million of valid requests. And we had all of that for like, you know, a million in federal funding and, and 2 million in state funding. And it just isn't enough and it's not right. And these are our most vulnerable students. And um, we talked a lot about equity and I, I can appreciate that our folks in the equity study don't feel like they can include special education because the outcomes are varied because of IEP. But that needs to stop being a reason to, to look at the inequities in our special education funding. So I also think people are trying to stockpile special education money. In fact, I know out of the people that I contacted because they feel like as funding fluctuates, their mandates and their laws and their responsibilities on IEPs don't go down. And you can't say to a family, well, we have lower funding this year, so we don't we can't meet the needs on your IEP. So we really have to tackle this and look at it hard. Um, I know a team has been meeting and they um, suggested looking at this as a three-year intensive service pilot program along with input from the LFA. And they, um, the original ask in the business case was an 8.2, I think, million, which is only status quo and that doesn't move the needle. This at least adds it's a drop in the bucket, but one more million dollars per year as we try to figure out how to um, eat this elephant. On a number two, as far as the most program, I know that each of you were sent by Cami Dupree, our awesome program director, um, 
input from lots of LEAs, uh, principals, teachers, students. We've heard from them all across the state. Um, after we got that survey information on the MOST program, we also heard from a board member from JUAB who said, we use this money to, to help our students have sections, extra sections of science and math. We heard from a teacher in Utah County who said, we are losing, this is for our math lab. We're losing our math lab if we lose these fundings. We heard from a charter director from Summit County who contacted Cami and said, I'm sorry to keep bothering you, but we're, we're literally losing a math teacher if we don't get this funding this year. Um, and I'll, I'll be 100% honest, this may not be as high on my priority list. If we hadn't have started this program and then kind of left people hanging, we were the ones that initiated this. There are a lot of things on this list I could actually advocate for, even that are just as important as this program. Um, but we did this, we initiated this, and we've left people sort of in the lurch. And, and, and I think if, if we're going to do that and not support the things that we start, then we should start fewer things until we can support the things we've already started. Um, I want to move funding priority number one to number eight on the list because that is one such thing. It's brand new. We haven't started it yet. Whereas I believe OEK, we've already started. We've got teachers in place. We've got classes in motion. So, um, and, and then obviously the others up there are so are very important because of our COVID situation right now with the broadband and the other things. So under this proposal, what the list would look like would be first priority would be OEK, second would be the broadband, third would be intensive services, fourth would be the students at risk, fifth would be the most program, um, sixth would be Oh, I have at risk in there twice. So six would actually be the re-engaging learners and uh, seven would be the professional development for pre-K through three. Okay, are there just questions or discussion, board member Belknap? Yes, chair, I would like to split all of these so that we can go through them one at a time. And I also have a question on Dale's. So I guess I need to make a motion first, but then I have questions from what Dale presented. Okay, well, uh, so are you making a motion to divide? Yes, I am. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Discussion to the motion. I still have other hands up, so I'm like, okay, um, board member Earl, motion to divide. Are you discussing that? Board member Earl, your hands raised. I'm sorry, I thought you were just making a statement that my hand was up to discuss down the road, not to, no, it's not to comment it's on motion, this. Motion to divide, so that. No comment on this. Okay. Angie, your hand's still up. Is there, do you have a challenge with the motion? No, um, not to the motion divide. Once you've divided the motions, and uh, I would like to give some background from the staff perspective on the request for the early grade professional learning, if I may, before the okay. board votes. Before, the, yeah, okay, after the- Not on the motion to divide, okay. I apologize, yes. Right. On the actual motion about moving priority number one to number eight. Okay, do we have a- the motion to divide, board member Davis, your hands up on the motion to divide. You're good. Sorry. Okay, we're, we're fine. It's just a little different as we're doing this online and hands are raised. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments of the motion before the board is a motion to divide board member Davis's motion. So that would divide it into three separate motions, one, two and three. Uh, all those in 
our rules and um, for the motion before the board is is to divide board members at this time, please vote. Uh, voting is complete and the motion passes unanimously. So we'll take these one at a time. <clears throat> okay, um, to item one, so the, the motion before the board is um, to add to the funding priority 12 million to add, add to a the funding priority oh. oh am i am i getting feedback or somebody maybe i'm getting feedback <clears throat> so the motion before the board is to add to the uh, funding priorities list 12 million one time for a three-year extensive services pilot program as funding priority number three. Uh, discussion to that motion. Board member Belknap. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I guess I have a question. This probably goes to Leah. Um, Leah, have the, have we ever not had enough intensive services money to give to our people? I really would like to know that. Is Leah sure, available? Yeah, well, yeah. Assistant Superintendent of Student Support. So, um, uh, Board Member Davis's uh, data was accurate. Um, the every year we have had considerably higher requests than we actually have funds. However, the the mitigating issue is. Um, some of the LEAs who have requested some of those funds, those $12 million, which of which we could only ever fund $4 million, um, had state special education carry forward dollars and that they could have chosen to use um, for, for this purpose. And because intensive services is a reimbursement, they did have to pay for those um, services and support. So they did pay for them with whatever fund um, they chose, but they also had um, carry forward funds. And so that's why the question came up of whether or not LEA who has significant state carry forward funds should be allowed apply for intensive services funds. But it is a separate question. But yes, every single year, we have had legitimately more requests than we have had funds. Okay, thank you. Okay. Board Member Davis, do you have a question or are you just? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak to this again. Um, you know, we're going to go back to this conversation about which came first, the chicken or the egg. And, and I'm going to go back and quote the Jordan business administrator again. And he says the person with, who keeps the most carry forward funds is the most committed to meet the needs of special education students because they cannot guarantee their funding, but the requirements don't ever go away. They don't reduce. So this is a, a big philosophical issue that we need to tackle. I think people have been given time. They know they need to reduce under the 20%, but people are going to continue to try to keep close to that 20% so that they aren't out of compliance if their funding is reduced and the special needs requirements remain. Um, I just want to read um, a, a quote quickly that I got from Linda Hansen today, um, who is a former board member. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, she said, if the legislature doesn't allocate the intensive services funds, then the districts have to make it up. So those with the very severe and expensive students end up having to pay so much money. It's not fair across the board. The charter schools have told me that they can't afford to pay the needs for the kids, so they try not to take them. 
Sometimes they end up arguing with the districts about who needs to pay. It's awful. Um, listen, this is something that we need to figure out and um, we need to do more than stay status quo. $8.2 million would stay status quo. $12 million over three years would almost stay status quo, but it would bump up a little. Um, it would not even meet half the needs of the requests. Uh, but overall, if we're gonna fix it, now's the time on the heels of Amendment G when we're saying we're gonna use funding traditionally earmarked for education for people with disabilities, let's use it for this and or let's use it to fix the 12% cap. How is it even legal we're telling our people they can only have 12% special education students? Or let's fix the two-year lag, which is costing people money and, and trying to figure out how to pay for special education students. Or let's fix the one WPU add-on to the one general WPU for special ed. Why are we only adding one WPU add-on when we just passed legislation last year for students to use up to two and a half WPU to go to a private school. Why aren't the students in our public school worth that much as well? There are serious issues with special education. We, we can hit all of these in our top priorities, but we have to start somewhere. At the same time, we do have to reduce our carry forward to the limit up to 20%, but this is a place to start at least. Okay, um, Vice Chair, Cummins. Um, yeah, just a, a quick question. So in this motion, uh, you have a, a one-time dollar amount and uh, the idea of a pilot program. And in speaking in favor of this particular motion, um, you've also mentioned a lot of uh, specific problems as well as um, a clear theoretical um, issues that need to be discussed. And I'm just curious if you think that this is the best time to go forward with a, a pilot program that we haven't defined, or would we be more likely to get the funding if we were very specific about how to solve the problems that you mentioned uh, with, you know, what can we solve without the, outside of this pop pilot program? What can we solve uh, in board rule and what do we need the legislature's help for? So I'm just curious if you'd speak to um, the timing on going forward with a well um, proposed plan that has an exact dollar amount of what we're trying to solve mm -hmm. and not just an amount and an idea of a pilot program, recognizing that there's a lot of issues that go um, into solving this problem. Chair, may I? Yes, please. Um, I do think this is the time one, because we've had our intensive services funds taken away, but two, because um, of Amendment G. But the reason that we're, I, I would rather have a very specific plan and ask for $5 million right now of ongoing funding every year. But the LFA suggested the three-year pilot program. And, and, I, and then a committee of people who were working with Dale Frost met and agreed um, that that might be a wise thing to do um, to try to figure out how to more equitably distribute these limited intensive services funds. I think we should ask for 12 million and fund all of these requests because these are already costs that have been incurred. But I am realistic and I know that um, we need to work in steps and we probably need to listen to the LFA. So this is why I'm um, going ahead with this motion at this time. Okay. Chair, may I uh, also add one thing to yes. um, Vice Chair Cummins' question? Uh, for uh, the, uh, for board members, you'll see the intensive services pilot program is actually the first item in the pass through budget items list on the tracker. And yeah, uh, I have worked as co-chair with Lindsay Cunningham from the special ed office. Uh, and we work very uh, in, uh, closely with a group of folks looking at both the rule on the federal fund side and also how could we best uh, address these needs. And I agree with member Davis that whether it's 8 million or 12 million, it scratches the surface of the need. 
Um, we, and trying to be, you know, realistic, you know, about where we think we can land, both of those would be well utilized. And the pilot program, if you look at the business case, there's uh, specific objectives that we want to get out of that. We won't be able to address all of the concerns that member Davis brought up, but we will be able to learn a lot about the issues related to finance and special education. So it is a good place to start with this issue. Vice Chair Cummins, your hand's still up. Yeah, just one um, follow-up question. Um, I, I I think pilot programs are, are two-edged swords sometimes. Um, they We have the opportunity to really learn uh, <laughs> things, but if the pilot program is not funded into the future, we've created some financial dependencies that then we can't continue forward with. Do you mind... In your conversations, uh, as you bring this forward, was there any discussion on that potential issue um, after the pilot program ends of, of not having funding available for um, things that you felt were very effective or were helpful uh, during the pilot process? Chair, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, Vice Chair Cummins, I uh, ab absolutely agree that pilot programs can be a one, uh, a two-edged sword. The, the, no one is disputing the need, but the actual structure of the program on how it was funded beforehand had a number of significant equity issues. We surveyed um, uh, LEAs across the state, I think we got 60 LEAs to respond to try to ascertain the, the number of, of, of high cost kids throughout. Y you are correct that there is a danger in getting one time funds and then no funds, uh, you know, three years from now. Um, I, I guess all I can say is that we think that we would be significantly more successful in advocating for one-time funds at this point. Um, and uh, the need is still there and, and improving the allocation model and learning from it and tweaking it every year so that we can come back in three years and have a really strong case on how to better fund these intense uh, high cost special ed kids who are so very vulnerable um, I, I guess that would be my response to that. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, board, board member uh, Belknap. Oh, yeah, board member Belknap, yours was up before. Sorry, Jan. Chair, I put my hand down. But Janet asked a question about who was the LFA that was was taught who suggested this three-year pilot and number two was Leah for my question was Leah involved in these discussions and in, in helping with this process I can answer the first part of that question so uh, Lindsay Cunningham and and I have been tasked by Leah um, and and she's been very involved and I know that she's been um, working closely with Leah, but I'd have Leah answer that part. Uh, but specifically, these were ideas uh, that were to try to address some of the fundamental concerns of the, of the previous program that was eliminated. And that was Ben Leishman and Emily Willis from LFA when we met with them. You have a follow-up? Yeah, I do. And, and when you said you met with them, who else met with the LFAs in you, Dell? Uh, Patrick Lee and uh, Lindsay Cunningham, myself, uh, I, I don't remember if there's anybody else. I know that uh, Scott wanted to be there, but wasn't there at that, at that meeting, but he's been very involved right. in these discussions too. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I, I just kind of want to speak to the direction that we're going. I, I think the dialogue is really great on on all all of these items. One of the challenges that I'm having as a board member is uh, I'm 
constantly reminded that we have a pandemic out there and COVID, with COVID and how it's affecting schools. Um, and I'm also concerned about limited, limited funding. <laughs> and I, I personally feel more comfortable almost another month in to say, okay, this is what that slice of pie with, with surety um, looks like in, in my space of um, putting priorities together. I, I, I've been really close to the LEAs that I work with and that, and right now their rescue, their lifeline is, is about the, it's all about the WPU right now. And um, I'm, so I'm, I'm really leery of, of putting a big shopping list together. And I also know that as these meetings evolve and that, that it'll be fine tuned um, as we get into the legislative session. So uh, I, I, have some, I have a few concerns. Um, but I don't have concerns over any betterment to public education. It's about, it's all about priorities and how much money we have uh, and managing expectations of all of our LEAs. Um, board member Earl, your hand is raised. Yeah, it's, it's maybe a little bit along the same lines. I do, I do think we need to, special education should be one of our priorities, but if, if we're going to be doing this today, then we're going to have, we should be putting something forward that says these are priorities, whether or not these change down the road. Um, from the LEAs I've talked to, from the schools I've talked to, the, the number one concern, and it kind of speaks, um, Chairman Huntsman, to what you're talking about, is they're saying, I need reduced class sizes and um, more support that way because I can get to my kids, but there's so many that if I had a smaller class size, that's anyways, that's the priority I'm, I'm hearing from them. They're dealing with a lot and trying to reach all their students. Um, that would be a priority I would be looking at. And I'm not even sure I see that on here anywhere, but you know, getting, giving them the WPU, whatever, so that they can, districts can do what they need to do. Good. Um, board member Lear. I'm kind of going, I'm going away from my 30 year career of saying money, put money in the WPU because the board starts that way. And then along comes a really persuasive legislator with a really great deal. And suddenly I'm still with put the money in the WPU and the board's deserted me. So I feel like this is the time, especially when it's a um, a pilot program, an opportunity for a smaller amount of money to see what happens go for, going forward. This is an opportunity to, to put our special programs um, and stick to it rather than um, forcefully believing we'll stay with the WPU and it never happens that way because it's there's always a cliff. There's always a legislator that it, you go with my program or you'll lose $300 million or so it, I'd rather stick with the program special program of my choice of the board's choice than um, do that same Lucy in the football um, game again that I've, I've been a slave to for 30 years. And board member Thorpe. I just wanted to weigh in and say that I think it's strategically savvy to make a request at, during this session that is about children and, and people with disabilities. And I think that, um, and putting forward this pilot given the unique circumstance we're in at this, during this session seems wise to me. Okay. Board member Lear, your hand's still up. Um, board member Davis, your hand's up. Okay. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to reprioritize. I may need to amend my motion. And now that we've divided the question, you'll have to guide me as to how to do that. So, if you would like, we we have one on the table, so you can take away or add to the motion. So. Right, right now you see a, a, the motion's red and that is to add to the funding priority 12 million one time 
for a three-year extensive service pilot program as funding priority number three. So if you wanna add something or take, take away, or if you wanna change a priority, that would be um, a change. So you're welcome to amend the motion in that fashion. Are you wanting to change, are you wanting to change your priority? Is that what I- Eric, don't get frustrated with me because three no. is day three, but I do want people to know that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna amend the others for one to stay one, early grade professional development. I'm getting a lot of feedback that needs to stay one. Two, I'm gonna propose OEK. Three would stay three intensive services, four broadband, five student centers, six engaged learners, and then seven the most. Your fun. motion, well, because of how we started, we only have one motion on the table. And that's fine. I just wanna give that heads up to folks okay. as they consider this one. Okay, so what's, what's on the, the motion before the board is, as I stated, this is priority number three. Okay, not seeing any further hands up. So I'll state the motion and then we'll vote. Uh, the motion before the board is that the um, board add to the funding priorities 12 million one time for a three year extensive service pilot program as funding Priority number three. Board members at this time, please vote. Make sure I've got everyone in here. Um, the voting is complete. The motion passes. The no vote, but not unanimously. Uh, the no votes are board member Earl. Am I seeing any other? I think that's the only one. Okay, do you have that? Lorraine? I need to know, is anyone absent? Is member Nielsen still on? Oh, I'm here, Lorraine. Oh, okay, I was just sorry. I just wasn't seeing your name on the list. Oh, I'm gonna find it again. I thought I just... Oh, I found it. it's down farther on the list. Sorry, Scott. Okay, that motion passes. Okay, the next motion uh, is that the board add to the uh, under the, the second part after the divide, 6 million ongoing for the most program as funding priority number five. Discussion to the motion, um, board member Belknap. I think Cindy had her hand up first, but that's okay. Um, okay she can... well, well, she she's the one on the motion. Let's let her speak to the motion independently. Is that, okay. can you hold there? Yep. Okay, board member Davis. Okay, I'd like to amend the motion. Okay. Um, I'd like to amend the motion to be consistent with the business case uh, with an ask of $7,200,000 and considering, and I'd like to move that to priority seven and I'd like to speak to the amendment. Can if we, it's a friendly we, amendment, it could just be the new motion. Okay. The Proposed amendment moves it to 7.2 million on the ongoing and changes the funding priority to number seven. Uh, you wanna to speak to the motion, to the amendment, proposed amendment? Yes. Um, 
I think the first one's self-explanatory. I'm just going back with the business case with what was actually allocated prior to COVID for this program. And it also included um, some of the new changes uh, to the most program. But then the second part of the amendment, moving it back down to number seven chair is um, it just listening to you and your concerns and taking your feedback about the need to address some of our COVID issues first. And so um, broadband students at risk and re-engaged learning are all uh, direct needs from COVID. So I am going to move number, most to number seven after those COVID needs. And this would just formally give this a number. Okay, so the proposed motion is to change the one number to 7.2 million ongoing and the funding prior priority is number seven, or uh, as number seven. Discussion to the proposed amendment. Um, board member Belknap. No? Okay. Yes? Well, yes, uh, but did we have a second and vote on the amendment yet? No. So I, you know what? I can't remember if we had a second. Let me go. Did we have a second? Was there a second? There was none. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. I'll second it. Lear. Board member Lear's got the second. Okay. Thank you, board member Belknap, for calling me out on that. Um, discussion, board member Belknap. Did you have any further? on the amendment. Well, I want to discuss it once it's the mo full motion. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any other discussion to the proposed amendment. So the proposed amendment before the board is to change the amount to 7.2 million ongoing for the most program as funding priority number seven. So it went from three to seven. Um, on the proposed amendment, board members, please vote. Okay, the motion passes. I believe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, yes votes for the motion is uh, member Hansen, member Thorpe, member Gravett, vice chair Cummins, member Lear, member Cannon, member Davis, member Newell, member Haynes, member Marsh. The, the, the no votes is member Bolter, member Nielsen, member Belknap, member Earl, and member uh, Huntsman. Okay, so the amended motion states that the board add to their funding priorities 7.2 million ongoing for the most program as funding priority number seven. Discussion to the motion, Vice Chair Cummins. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, opposed to this motion. Um, the reason being is I, I, dream of a day when we have a more simplified budget where we don't uh, fund or create uh, very, very specific programs that not only require um, budgeting complications, but also with reporting complications. These are, these are, this is money for teacher hires. And if we focus this money into the WPU, then LEAs have the freedom and the ability to hire and to pay as they see fit. And I just, I just struggle as we um, pull apart the flexibility of LEAs to, to, to create um, 
solutions to their problems uh, when we just kind of pull apart the, the whole funding into less, less flexible, smaller pieces of the pie. And so I'm not in favor of this moving forward. Member Davis. Uh, look, I, I don't disagree. So let's not start stuff then. But we started this and a lot of people are left hanging and they're using that last bit of carry forward that they didn't use in spring to get through fall. And, and they are, we've heard from a ton of them, many, many, many people. So let's not start stuff if we aren't going to finish it. And I, I would tend to, tend to agree, but we started this and we should support it and finish it. And then really carefully consider if what we're going to start in the future. Um, Member Belknap. Yeah, I tend to agree with um, Vice Chair Cummins on this one that we really need to be strategic and 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 put this in the WPU and allow our districts to use it. And so it isn't that we would be canceling the most program; it would be wrapped up in their WPU, and the districts have their choice whether to use it that way or not. Um, Member Earl. Yeah, once again, I think Cindy did articulate that well. We shouldn't start something that we could be putting in the WPU and letting the districts decide. That's that's kind of my, and on almost all this, we're expanding, expanding, expanding on things that we have to monitor, including some of these, um, um, where are we? Some of the some of the programs dealing with um, supports for at-risk students. It's districts know what they need. Um, let's put the funding there. Let them decide instead of us having to monitor it and and um, keep track of it and make sure it's done right. Let them do it right. They're very competent to do that. Member Davis, your hand's still up. I'll just say sometimes you can achieve goals with a state um, driven initiative. I think this one was a good one because what I have heard from people is this is one of their favorite that's ever come out of our office. Um, again, I think we need to support what we started and then just carefully figure out what we're gonna start in the future. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands up. The motion before the board is um, the amended motion before the board is um, moved to our priority list 7.2 million ongoing for the most program as funding priority number seven. That's a motion before the board. Um, board members, please vote. The motion doesn't pass. Uh, the yeas is member Hansen, member Thorpe, member Gravett, member Lear, member Cannon, member Davis, member Haynes. The nays, uh, member Bolter, member Nielsen, member Marsh, member Newell, Vice Chair Cummins, member Vilnap. Member Earl and Member Huntsman. The next item is to move, um, and that divided motion is to, uh, is that number three here is uh, to prior prioritize um, or is this how it was felt? Is this how it was in the very beginning of the motion? Move funding priority number one, early grades professional learning to priority number eight. Chair, I don't think no. it, uh, I think it's nullified at this point. I'll just withdraw the motion. It will stay at number one. 
You can't. It belongs to the body. Yeah, Can I, I can't control. withdraw it. No, not not that it it's out and it's second. Uh, you can make a motion. I believe you can make a motion to postpone, which means it's postponed indefinitely. Is that correct, Lorraine? She could just um, petition the body to see if she could withdraw it. And you could just, uh, with objection, withdraw it. Without objection, and then we don't vote on it? Yes. Okay, well, that's, that's a good pathway. So without any objection, we're removing number three. Um, not seeing anybody objecting. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna please, I guess we're gonna continue. Member Davis, your hands raised. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Some of, some of you still have um, votes loaded on, on the screen. Okay, um, any other input or motion from the board? I'm seeing none. So on the funding priority list, this will keep coming back um, meeting after meeting, so we will I'm not seeing, I'm just triple checking here. Uh, Member Cannon. Yes, uh, at one point in the discussion, uh, Angie Stallings indicated she would like to speak to that early grades professional learning. And may we just hear from her what she wanted to tell us about it. Okay, it's a fair request. Um, Deputy Superintendent Stallings. Thank you, Board Member Cannon. And now that the uh, Board Member Davis withdrew her motion, it was um, just to give some background and context as to why staff had prioritized the early grades professional learning uh, $5 million ask as number one. Now that it has been withdrawn, I don't wanna take the board members time, but if you did want to hear the reason why, I would defer to Jennifer Thronson who has some data about um, how our early learners, those in our K-3 grades, have been impacted most by COVID learning loss and how um, staff have identified a need to provide um, professional learning to those early grade instructors to be able to support students who've had some um, learning loss issues. So could she send that information to the board? And Chair Huntsman, if I may, I think that uh, Assistant Superintendent Nelson addressed this a little bit when he was talking about assessment. He did share those data points. Okay. Thank you. Board Member Davis, your hands raised. You're muted. And I appreciated those reminders from those who sent that to me. And that's why I reconfigured that and then I just want to ask a question. So, so our most program will not be in the number seven spot of priority, but it stays on our list because we've already voted to reinstate that legislation, correct? Am I understanding that correctly? I, I can't speak to the previous motion. Is there somebody can speak to that, Angie, or you know? Mm -hmm. I, I'd be happy to, and, and I don't know if Dale at this point, I could stop sharing again um, to show everybody the original list that you were showing. But if you look at the list that's in the backup, you'll see that there's different categories. So first you've got the WPU and enrollment growth. Then you have what was the top five priorities after that, which are now top six. And then um, after those top six, you'll see the beginning list of all the business cases. And yes, um, board member Davis, you're correct that one of the 
business cases is the most program. Also, just as a reminder, one of the board's statutory requests was also to ask staff to work with a legislator to open a bill file. We have done that. And in fact, we've already seen a draft of the bill to reinstate the most program. So that is in the works. When I um, spoke with the legislator about the, the bill, I did tell him that the amount to be prioritized would depend on this process, of course. And then if, uh, as the legislative process goes, um, you know, as we see more funding or less funding appear, sometimes our list changes based on um, the amount of funding available. So I don't know if that helps. It is on our list. It's just not in the top six. Thank you. Yes. So it did not remove it from our radar. Okay, board member Belknap. Thank you. So, so somewhere I'm wondering, um, the top five priorities were get were presented by the board. I mean, by our staff, but I don't believe we voted on those. I believe you're correct. I'm sorry, Chair Huntsman. Go ahead. There was a prepared motion to um, prioritize those. So if you would like, I could display the motion with the now the top six to make that official. I, I thank you for that reminder. But I, but I do have a question, Chair, and it's yeah. actually on the, on number one, now I've forgotten the name of it, the early teaching. How much money is already in our early learning professional area. How much money is already set aside there? Chair, I can answer that question. Okay. I was just seeing if Scott jumped in or you can, Bill. Yeah, so this was a, a new program that uh, there were professional development dollars that were eliminated you know, years ago. And so this was going to be a new program that was defunded. Um, and, and so uh, professional learning, so there is some money for coaches, but not money specifically to enhance coaching and some of those things with professional learning, if that answers your question. It doesn't. How Remember, much is set aside for early learning? For right now, I would say um, zero is set aside and dedicated for that purpose. Well, there's some for coaching, and that would be part of it. Uh, Jennifer? Yes, uh, it's 15 million is set aside for K3 early literacy. Uh, as Dale was trying to suggest, that money is not dedicated towards professional learning and has been used to support coaching with 96 to 98% of it being in salaries. Thank you. Thank so, you, Jennifer. So Beth, board member Belknap, as we're still on this, this item, um, everything what we're doing and this is driven by motion and I'm not seeing anyone hand raised to make any motion. So with those staff recommendations, they'll probably come back next month and, and it'll still, it will still be there. So, so with that, board member Davis, I believe your hand's raised. I move that we adopt these six priorities. So the recommended motion, if this is what you're wanting to say, is that the um, the proposed motion is that the board prioritize as their top priority budget items the following business cases in their specific order, and then that would be one through six. Um, and then they would be read out to so have clarity. Would that, would that be your motion, Board Member Davis? Yes. So we need to add number six. Oh, there it is right there. I'm, I'm, I've got my screen split again and I haven't lost anything. So, um, so Board Member Cannon. Is there a second? Board Member Cannon. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, Discussion to the motion. Uh, maybe I better state the motion. I'll do it quickly as you're preparing 
for discussion. The motion is that the board prioritize as other top priority budget items as following the following business cases in the specific order. Number one, early, early grade professional learning for 5 million ongoing. Number two, optional enhanced kindergarten for 8,692,200 ongoing. Is that correct? Dell, am I reading that correctly? Okay. Number three, and this was re really straining my eyes, but I think I can get it out. Uh, 12 million ongoing for a three year extensive service pilot program. Number four, expanded access to broadband. Sorry. What's that? Yeah, the 12 million is actually one time. Oh, 12, 12, 12 million one time. Thank you. One time for a three year extensive service pilot program. Number four, expanded access to broadband for 5 million one time and 350,000 ongoing. Number five, supports for students at risk for 10 million one time. And number six, re-engaging learners who are disconnected for 5 million one time. Is that correct, Dale, according to, or Angie, according to the motion? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Okay. That is the uh, motion before the board. Um, board member Davis, do you want to speak to the motion? Or speak more to the motion? <laughs> no, I want to go for it. <laughs> okay. All right. Discussion to the motion. I am seeing none. So I'm not going to restate the motion because I just barely read it. Uh, board members, at this time, uh, please vote. Can't find my cue here. Okay, the motion passes with um, two uh, no votes. The no votes are board member Earl, board member Bolter, and all members are still with us. So thank you for staying with us. Uh, any questions, um, Lorraine? No, I got it. Okay, motion passes, thank you. I am not seeing any other hands raised. But so I believe we're ready to move to um, 20.3, which is our statutory changes. Um, Deputy Superintendent Angie Stallings. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have two to share with you today. Um, the first one is you'll, you'll remember last year, there was legislation that we worked on with Representative Jefferson Moss, the State Chair School Board and others. Um, to explicitly require charter schools to follow GASB along with FASB. There is a reference right now um, in code that defines generally accepted accounting principles to include FASB. And as staff, we recommend um, deleting that reference to FASB and making it clear that LEA, all LEAs would be using GASB. So that is number one. And if I may, I'll, should I just go on to number two, Chair? Yes, and Okay, and then number two is actually related to funding priority number one that you saw just a moment ago. Um, back during the 2020 session, you'll remember that the legislature passed HB 114, which is early learning training and assessment amendments. That bill was funded at $5 million last year, but a little over 1 million of it was was funded for um, or directed to be spent on a math assessment as well as uh, stipends or funding to be used at the higher ed level to pay for um, student teachers 
who were receiving their pedagogical assessments or, or for the cost of taking that. Um, we believed based on funding and the priority that we just made in our in the last motion that we would probably we may only be left with the professional learning portion of that bill that bill had quite a few things in it I would say four kind of chunks, including um, a chunk of funds that would have gone to our recess. Um, and, and now, based on what happened in COVID, we believe that the priorities could change. So we would like to ask for a bill file to be open in order to amend last year's HB 114 accordingly, depending on the money that's ultimately um, prioritized by both the board and the legislature. And so we're not exactly sure at this point what portions would be removed. Um, although right now, based on the motion that was just made, the five million dollars, if that uh, the legislature takes that recommendation, would be focused on the professional learning and not spent on the other things that were included in that bill. So those are the two staff uh, presented recommendations for um, or, or requests for uh, approval um, or a green light to work with legislators to open those two bill files. Um. Why don't why don't you continue on? I'm not seeing any hands raised to, to the other statutory changes, and then I'll see what and happens. That is and the point is, if the board wants to package all of this the way that it is and continue forward, then I would seek a motion uh, that the board direct staff to work with the legislators on potential amendment to Utah Code as proposed. It's not the end game, but it starts them. So if you would continue to the next two. And actually on the list that was presented, um, sorry, I didn't, I meant to, um, didn't mean to show that motion yet, but I do, I ha do know that board member Davis has a motion. So the two that I already showed you are the two that staff prepared and that were in your backup. So um, there's nothing okay. else on this list. The rest of these are all already approved. If you see the, the board, then you start with the board approved requests for statutory okay. changes. So there's only two today uh, from staff. Only two, okay. All right, uh, board member Davis. So do I, do I move just to add this one in with these and then we vote on all of them? You can make a motion to approve you can make a motion if you cho choose to direct staff to work with the legislature on potential amendment to the Utah code as proposed and. Okay, so everything you, you just said. And I move that staff work with legislature to amend or waive employee evaluation requirements for the 2020 to 21 school year. And I can speak to that. Any grab it second. Okay, we have a motion. And a second, um, Board Member Davis. Yeah, um, we already have made an adjustment in the evaluation process where we asked for the um, the summative forms to be waived and that educators could be evaluated on a formative this year if they were not provisional or remedial. But there are some provisions in code that need to be looked at and examined. And for example, in the code, it says you have to submit six lines of evidence. So with this motion, there may be a possibility of waiving that code, or perhaps they go in and amend and say, for this year during COVID, submit one line of evidence or whatever they deem is appropriate and doesn't cause unintended negative consequences. This gives flexibility to our folks to work with legislators to adjust what they need to adjust to give our LEAs flexibility in the evaluation space during this one year. Okay, any other discussion to the proposed motion? I'm seeing Seeing none, a lot of you still have your previous vote still up. So if you guys will take a peek at board member Earl, you have a question or do comment? A, do we have a legislator we're already working on with this or is this something that we're just, we're anticipating doing? Is there already dialogue going on? Does someone know? 
Thank we you. have no bill files open on these three. I will say there was a legislator based on some Twitter activity uh, about a month ago who actually reached out to me and asked based on this, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of teachers mentioning educator evaluations. I would imagine he asked if the board was interested in doing this. I don't think he opened a bill file, but um, mm -hmm. since I knew he had interest about three weeks ago, I will reach out to him. But so far there's no bill file open, nobody working to do any of these three things yet. But I will reach out after, if if they pass today. And, and okay, we do I, have, go ahead. I, I guess my thoughts, and I probably need to do a little bit more investigation into this, is the concern about removing um, any kind of evaluation, especially at this time when we do want to keep a thoughtful um, perspective on, on how our teachers are doing. And um, with that being said, I can see amending it. I would, I, I'm a little nervous about completely waiving it um, because I think, I think there is some thoughtful uh, feedback that needs to come from that. So um, anyways, thank you. Board Member Belknap. Yeah, Board Member Earl, as we were looking at this, we did, the whole thought process was, let me just make sure, the whole pro thought process is, is that we would give them less to report up to us, not to waive all their rights or abilities to, to evaluate their own people. Okay, that's, that's probably what I'm looking at more. I just was concerned about the possible language or, or ramifications of this, so thank you. And again, we will see that bill file and be able to still comment as it's progressing. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other hands. The motion before the board, I mean, where's it back on my, oh, I gotta get that last little piece in, is that the board directs staff to work with legislat legislators on potential amendments to the Utah code as proposed, including, where was her language? Can you guys bring that real thing back real fast? Oh, right there. Uh, and demand or waive employee evaluation requirements for the 2020-21 school year. Board members at this time, we have a, a motion before the board, please vote. Board Member Davis, we're not seeing you on here. Thank you. Uh, voting is complete and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you.